Welcome back to the Chase the Independence podcast. I'm your host, Chase Selmeyer, and thank you for being here today. Hope you guys are ready to lock and load some awesome information and get some value out of this episode. To give you a heads up what's been going on here, we've finally kind of gotten into the swing of things. You know, this is still a new podcast. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm producing, doing these audios, recording, editing them, posting them all myself. And it's been a lot of fun uh, reaching out to these guests as well and trying to book them. But I've actually got some sort of schedule finally down. Uh, my goal right now is we'll be posting these every two weeks on Monday. Originally, we were posting these shows as they came in. But uh, now with a great backlog of guests and everybody being very open to be on the show, which has been awesome, uh, we've got great content and, like I said, a lot in line to be posted. So every two weeks on Monday, stay tuned. Uh, likewise, we also have our mini episodes. Those are 20 to 30 minute long segments. Uh, we're not necessarily talking to professional athletes, but we're talking to people who are professionals in their field. So whether it's e-commerce, branding, online sales, uh, design, creatives, all that kind of stuff, um, I want to be able to bring those people in and, and still get some great value out for you guys. So stay tuned for those. Every 5th, 10th, 15th episode, etc., we'll be posting those. You can visit kangamarketing.com forward slash podcast to see all the upcoming and past episodes. So if you want to see what we got coming up, you can find me on Instagram at Chase Selmeyer. Shoot me a DM, say what's up, ask questions for future guests, whatever. And I also got a black lab named Max who travels around with me quite a bit doing all sorts of crazy things from surfing the uh, hydrofoiling. So check that out if you like animals. And yeah, that's about it. All right, guys. We're going to jump into today's episode. I am really excited about today's guest. We have a CEO of an amazing sunglasses company. Not only is this individual an expert in e-commerce branding, but he has a really good feel for what good marketing is. And I think this is just a natural thing from growing up in action sports his whole life. He talks a lot about the importance of why being around people in this industry has influenced him and the feel of his brand and also helped him create and reach great demographics. He breaks down user profiles, how he sells online, what they're actually spending, and what he did to attract one of the largest eyewear brands in the world to acquire 70% of his company for $19 million. The story is really cool. The reasons why he did it is awesome. And I couldn't be more stoked because today's guest is the owner and founder of Blender's Eyewear, Chase Fisher. Blender's is most notably known as being one of the largest disruptors in the sunglasses industry. Their founder, Chase, talks a lot about his experiences as a young Grom growing up surfing in Santa Barbara and the lessons he learned that transitioned into his life as an entrepreneur. All right, let's kick this episode off in Blender style with a man who lives life in forward motion, Chase Fisher. For me, when I was starting, I always thought entrepreneurs had to be 4.0 students, had to be super, super smart. And the truth is you don't have to be smart to be successful. You know, you just like hard work outpaces being genius minded and hard, the harder you work and, and the discipline you have towards something, if you're passionate about it, like you will make it, you know, the best advice I ever got was the only way you're going to fail is this is if you stop. All right, we are back for another episode of Chasing Independence. I'm your host, Chase Selmeyer. And today, I, like I said in the intro there, I am really excited to jump into this episode. I've got an awesome guest, Chase Fisher. Uh, but before we jump into this, I want to give a little backstory to my love for sunglasses. When I was in high school, I was a semi-professional wakeboarder, competed in these amateur leagues and everything, and it was a lot of fun. I loved those times. It taught me competition and kind of really just mastering the skill of, of being on the water and, and doing what I had to do to, to get on the podium. But one of the coolest things back then was getting a sponsor. Like That's what every Grom like strives for and wants. And for me, it was all about getting that sunglasses sponsor. And I remember we had Oakley and then Oakley sold out. And then I went to our net and like, I just had thought I had made it. Like that was the coolest thing. But I mean, the truth of it was that I didn't have anything other than a free pair of sunglasses, but that was the world to me. And that was the coolest time ever. And so that's why today's guest, which is Chase Fisher, the owner of Blender's Eyewear. I just know that if they were around when I was a little Grom in high school, that is the company I want to be introduced with. That's the company I want to hang with because they literally have like the coolest team, the coolest products, and the branding, everything that goes behind it is just is off the wall. So guys, welcome Chase Fisher to the podcast. Chase, what's going on? Chase, right back at you, man. How we doing? I'm doing good. Hey, real quick, where'd the name Chase come from? Because you don't meet too many Chases. You know, my mom actually came up with it. Um, thank God my mom named me Chase because my dad wanted to name me something like super generic. But yeah, you're right. I don't meet too many Chases either. 
Um, you're like one of the few that I know. <laughs> How old are you? I'm 32. Yeah. So I think um, my mom told me this, that there was a, a soap opera back in the day and it came out like right after I was born. So I'm 35. I was born in 1985. So right after I was born, there was a soap opera that had a really popular character on it and his name was Chase. And it was like the first kind of like introduction of that name into like the mainstream. So who knows? You might have to ask her if that's where she got it from. I'm going to, I'm going to ask my mom, actually. That's a good, that's a good tip for yeah. sure. I should know. <laughs> I, I can't tell you what the show was. You know, obviously I'm not a soap opera guy, but you know, it's all good. But, um, I'm sitting here, I actually got my favorite blenders with me. I got my, the stone with these stone breakers, right? Yeah. Stone breakers. Dude, nice. there when, you go. when these came out, you couldn't find them anywhere. They were like going off the shelves like crazy. I mean, it sounds like everything you put out, but these are epic, man. I love those them. Those are hot. I get complimented on them all the time. The girls love them. The guys love them. And so, yeah. Well, Chase, dude, like I said, I'm pumped to have you on here. You're calling us from California. You guys have been on this like self quarantine for quite a little bit. And it sounds like you're, you're kind of, pushing through a little bit longer with that. Um, but let's jump into it. Uh, we got a lot to talk about, but before that kind of tell me where you're from, kind of how you got involved in action sports and maybe what that kind of genre was like at a young age growing up in California. For sure. So, um, my name's Chase Fisher. I'm from Santa Barbara. Um, super cool town, you know, a couple hours north of San Diego, uh, you know, really big in kind of action sports and beach culture. Right. I started surfing at age seven, my grandparents took me to the beach and I didn't want to go. I was crying the whole way to the beach. And they said, you guys are going to surf camp for, for me and my sister. And that was the day that kind of changed my life, I guess, you know, surfing from that point forward kind of became the compass to my life. And, um, I just became obsessed with it. You know, I started competing, uh, junior high throughout high school. Um, I go to all the surf competitions. I get tons of free shit, stickers, you know, hoodies, sweatshirts. And I just started collecting all these things. And I think that's when my kind of, you know, love for brands really kind of came into play. Um, I was never good enough to go pro, but I just loved being around the industry. I loved being around friends and, and competing and just the whole vibe. And so I moved to San Diego because I would go down to San Diego a lot for contests. And I just started loving San Diego. It was just a big Santa Barbara. So I moved to San Diego for, uh, you know, for college. I went to San Diego State. I was on the surf team there. And yeah, I just loved it down here. You know, there's tons of tons of waves. You know, there's tons of girls. It was just it's the, the mecca of Southern California culture. So I went to San Diego State, and then after I graduated, I started Blenders. And you know, the whole i the whole idea kind of came from a nightclub. I was actually wearing some five dollar beater shades at a club, and everyone in the club was coming up to me asking about my shades, like, "Where'd you get them? Let me try them on." Um, and at the time, I was a surf coach. I was a surf instructor down at the beach, just giving surf lessons all day, and started noticing, you know, a huge gap in the market between the beater shades I was wearing and your two hundred dollar Oakleys that I couldn't afford. So I was like, "Wow, what a you know what a." good place to, you know, start a sunglasses brand. Like if it's not going to work here, it's not going to work anywhere. And jumped into, jumped into the pool, you know, head first with $2,000 that I borrowed from my roommate. <laughs> that's, that's wild. You could tell this story better than I can, but how did you come up with the kind of the first design and how did you raise money past that $2,000? Yeah. So my business partner, I was looking for like a designer and he happened to be living right next to me. And so I lived on a street called Hornblend. And he was a graphic designer at a, you know, at the art Institute down here. Um, and he was actually interning at another sunglass company at the time. So I told him the idea, he was fired up on it. Three days later, we had a logo. We called it blenders because we lived on a street called Hornblend, And we just started making, you know, different mock-ups. Um, we made a Facebook page before even having a product that we started, you know, building on releasing concepts and different mocks and, um, you know, sunglass designs to get feedback. We had 2,000 fans before even having a product, so that really validated the idea. It really validated that there was a you know demand for this product that people wanted to buy it. So if we actually went through with it, it was going to work. Um, so you know, launching a company for us was actually we did it backwards, right? You know, we we started before we even had a product um, and just kind of tested the market that way. And then when it came to getting money, you know, uh, you know, obviously 2,000 bucks didn't get us very far. We ran out of money pretty quickly, <laughs> so we did a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo and raise an additional $7,000 to really kind of help expand our line from there. And that kind of helped us really get started, right? Because we went from one pair to five different styles and we had 200 different people that backed our campaign. And that way we were able to build a customer base, you know, pretty quickly from that, from that point forward. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it all started. That's huge. Yeah, because you hear a lot of these professional athletes who've started brands or started companies, they have kind of that namesake They've got a following or, you know, they can get press releases quite easy. But for you to kind of create a, a following based around some images, I mean, that's pretty amazing. And then, and then using the Internet to blow it up. 
Yeah. I mean, look, like this was pre kind of Instagram days, right? This is 2012. This is when like Instagram was just getting popular um, or really wasn't even that popular at the time. Um, but we were basically, I was pounding the pavement, you know, I was selling these shades out of a backpack on the beach for years. I was selling them on the boardwalk. I was selling them at pool parties. I was selling them at music festivals, literally one pair, one style, one person at a time. Um, cause we didn't have any experience. We didn't know how to drive traffic to our website. We didn't know how to build a brand online. Um, so I started like the only way I knew how, which was like my childhood action sports days, like going to contests, slapping stickers on street signs, like just super grassroots, super guerrilla marketing. Um, that's the only way I knew how to start, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, humble beginnings for sure. <laughs> now that's wild. You know, in action sports, uh, and let's go back maybe to your early days in competing and surfing. And, you know, me personally too, you know, I started a marketing company based around action sports because I've been around these brands so long and you kind of pick up on things that they're doing. Who are some of your big influences maybe from a brand standpoint and how did that affect you? Like you said, when in that kind of hustle to get out there and do different things. Yeah. Like, look, like I always loved going to contests and like, I love seeing the logos on the boards. Right. I thought all like the surfers and like the pros were like the coolest people in the world. You know, they'd show up with their cool wetsuits and their Hurley logos their rip pro logos their O'Neill logos. And I was like, God, I want that so bad, you know? Um, but you know, brands I've always looked up to as a kid, like, you know, Red Bull's my favorite brand. I think they've, you know, they're, they're best in class from a, you know, content branding, um, community standpoint. Uh, I love Hurley as well. Obviously Hurley has gone through a lot of transitions over the last, you know, six months, but um, they've always been a brand that I've, I've, I've liked because, because of the Nike aspect, um, you know, GoPro is also another brand that I think is just has done radical stuff over the years. Um, so those are brands and then oh, Oakley too, you know, I mean, I got a nod at Oakley. I think Oakley's built a really cool brand. Um, and so blenders is kind of a new school millennial Oakley um, affordable Oakley, I guess you would say. Um, so yeah, those are brands that I've always looked up to that I've thought have done a, you know, really good job and that we grasp uh, inspiration from. Do you think your action sports, uh, your time in like surfing and being on the beach, like the lessons you learned from that really helped push you in being able to interact with people and, and be that guy on the ground selling sunglasses, to sunglass one by one? Yeah, you know, for sure. I mean, like I said, I was never good enough to like drop out of school and make a career out of surfing, but I was good enough to uh, get sponsored. And I was good enough to self-market myself and learn how to provide value on the athlete side to brands, uh, not from like a winning podium status, but from like a, okay, I know a lot of people. I have a huge network. I can wear your products. I can talk about your products. I can get all my friends to wear your products. Um, and so that's how I was able to really provide value um, to brands. And so for me, I had to kind of carve my own path, right? Like I love the industry so much, I but I had to find a way to be relevant. And it wasn't going to be from winning contests. It was going to be from um, doing it in other ways. And so I think that's what entrepreneurship is all about. You know, it's all about blazing your own path. It's all about figuring it out. It's, there's no rule book. There's no formula to success here. You just got to kind of get up off your ass and figure it, figure it out by yourself, you know? Um, so for me, it's definitely taking things that I've learned back in the day and applying them to, you know, real life. All right. That's dude, that's unreal. You're right. Because I think a lot of sponsors will look at athletes and you could be a podium top winner, but if you don't got personality and you can't talk to the kid on the beach, that's coming to get your autograph. You're really not worth shit. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah <laughs> so, totally. that's cool. Well, let's jump into some current business or, you know, not even current, but let's go back. Um, you got your first product line out. At what point do you start selling online? And like, what were some of the major, uh, maybe obstacles you had to overcome in those first, let's say five years? Right. So obviously I've only known the athlete side up until starting blenders, right? Like I only knew what it was like to be on the athlete side and being on the athlete side is pretty damn cool. Like you get to, you get to put the stickers on your board, you get all the free shit, you get to like, you know, you get all do photo shoots and all that stuff. So like that is really cool. Right. But on the business side, it's a whole different story. Um, so I went into blenders. I was 23. I was like this young buck thinking I'm going to hit an overnight success. I'm going to hit a home run on day one. Our first order of sunglasses is 300 pairs. I literally show up on our, on our first day of launch thinking I'm going to sell all 300 pairs. Like I'm like, Chase, you're going to sell 300 pairs. No question about it. I sold 10 pairs that day, 10 fucking pairs. And I was like, holy shit. Like this is my first time being punched in the mouth as an entrepreneur. And I was like, this is going to be very, very hard. Um, and so that was probably the most sobering, humbling experience of my life at that point. And then from that point forward, you're just like, uh, okay, what do we do? You know? Um, and then you have to figure out manufacturing, you got to figure out supply chain. Like you literally have to start building this house one brick at a time. 
Um, and you know, we didn't start with any money, right? So we had to learn how to do more with less. And I had to learn how to do a lot of different, you know, parts of the business, build certain parts of the business and then hire out for those different, um, for those different, you know, hires that we needed. So tons of obstacles, obviously, but I think the resiliency of, of getting back up and just keep, keep going is what makes this the most rewarding experience ever. You know, where does, do you think your kind of entrepreneurship bone comes from? Do you, is your family very entrepreneurial? Was it again, the sports yeah. or what? Um, it's funny because my dad started a, a business back in the day, you know, he saw the movie Jerry Maguire and, and the slogan, show me the money. And he actually trademarked that slogan and sold it to TriStar Pictures who produced the who produced Jerry Maguire. And so my dad started a business, you know, and he was an entrepreneur at heart. Um, and so I used to see him kind of like anywhere that there was cell phone or internet, you know, reception, he was able to work. And I, and I saw that. And my mom was a court reporter. So like completely different paradigms of, of, of thinking and just different outlooks of, on life. So I think the entrepreneur side probably came from my dad, but like the rational side came from my mom. So I kind of got the best of both sides. Um, but yeah, and then just, you know, I started a business in high school. I was selling stickers, you know, to kids in class, like stickers that I would get at surf contests, I would sell to students in my class. Um, I was making like 10, 10 bucks a day. I had zero, zero dollars in cogs. I was hundred percent profitable and I just loved it. You know what I mean? So I think just like starting little things when I was younger, kind of like attributed to a bigger, a bigger picture here. Really cool. Yeah. Did you ever have a run in maybe with the school? They're like, why is this guy got all his cash on him? <laughs> you I know. Get in trouble? <laughs> I was pretty sly, man. I was yeah. pretty sly about it. But uh, yeah, I was I was pulling out 10 bucks a day. I was feeling, I was feeling pretty yeah, that's good. That's pretty huge, yeah. <laughs> I went to a Catholic school and I, um, my dad was an airline pilot. We, he came back from Shenzhen, China one time with a bunch of fake knockoff like DVDs and watches and purses and stuff. And he's like, hey, we're going here in two weeks. So I run into school with like a little receipt pad. I start selling the hell out of all yeah. stuff I didn't have. I'm walking out like I had like 600 bucks in cash. And one of my teachers who hated me comes around the corner and sees all this money and she takes it from me. And I'm like, oh, well, I got to go to China with this stuff to buy product from kids and bring it back. And long story short, I got the money back, got the product in the hands. But it was, you're right. Like, you got to be you gotta, gotta be careful sometimes in school, man. Totally. <laughs> Especially nowadays. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, that's cool. All right. So we are, you know, at what point did you kind of see that that turning point for blenders where it wasn't just, you know, OK, obviously you you had your you're in it full heartedly. Uh, you had that 300 order, only 10 sold, you know, you, you had to kind of figure it out. But from that point on, where was like the turning point for you in the business where you realized like, man, this is really a viable company and I could scale this. Totally. Yeah. I would say like probably the first page we turned that we're like, okay, we can, we can see something here was, was when, you know, Instagram really kind of surfaced for us, right. was when we were able to navigate from Facebook to Instagram and start building a visual identity for the brand. And as well as starting to network with photographers and influencers and athletes. And I would spend so much time just reaching out to photographers, reaching out to different people that were influential and, you know, exchanging sunglasses for content. Like we couldn't pay for any content. So we just used sunglasses as another form of currency. And before we knew it, I had like tons of photographers coming into our office, picking up shades, sending in photos. And we started to really ident like build a, a good look for the brand. Right. And Instagram kind of gave us that platform to do that. Um, and so we just started utilizing it like crazy and, um, we ran giveaways and built up a really loyal following to then we can basically use that following to, um, direct traffic to our website. And then from that point forward, it was about building Facebook ads and starting to do paid and building your e-com funnel out and building the brand online. And so that was a big, a big piece to it for sure at the beginning stages. Um, and yeah, that definitely helped us. Absolutely. It's amazing what you can get for a pair of sunglasses. I mean, like you can take a twenty dollars pair of sunglasses and get like five hundred dollars in value or more, probably. I'm sure. I mean, yeah, a lot of people do anything for a pair of sunglasses, so I can see that. Yeah, I mean, your content stands out. I mean, if you're online and you even come across a post or without even seeing the name blenders, a picture anywhere, it's very recognizable. Was that something that you were very meticulous about? And when working with the photographers, would kind of like make sure that everything was falling in place. Yeah. So I, I, I spent a lot of time trying to like find the right look for the brand. And I took a, I probably drove our team crazy because I wanted it to be, I literally wanted it to be perfect, you know, and I wanted it to be a, a feeling and a look to where if you're scrolling your feed and there's no logo and you come across a blender's photo, you're like, Oh shit, I know that's a blender's photo. You know, like, so that was the goal. Um, and I think it's super important. I think when you're starting a brand, like you have to have that, you know what I mean? You have to have that, um, you know, attention to detail. You got to stand out. You got to be different. You got to make people like, 
like you got to wow them. You know what I mean? And so we're a colorful brand. We're, uh, you know, we're like drenched in passion and then we definitely comes off in our products and, um, we want people to kind of recognize that and kind of remember that. So for sure. Yeah. You definitely did a good job with that. Like I said, I think it, it is stand, it stands out above all rest and, uh, of eyewear. I mean, there's so many brands you're competing with on a daily day basis that that is important. What, what kind of recommendations do you have for somebody not in, in necessarily in the same space, but a business that's trying to stand out online right now? I mean, look, like it's crowded, right? Right now is really crowded. Um, and obviously, you know, it's, it's a lot more crowded than it ever has been, but I think, I think it's really just about marrying a good product with a good experience, you know? And I think that's how you stand out. Like, I think the visual identity is important, but you need a product that has a shareable aspect to it, you know, and you need to marry that with good people behind your brand and a good story. Like that's what people want these days. It's, it's not all about looks. It's all about connection. And can that connection comes from that connection comes from storytelling. It comes from, um, you know, being relatable, like humanizing your brand, you know, like a lot of these bigger brands are faceless and there's just no connection. There's no, there's no like intimacy there. So I think today's society really screams for that and they really fiend for that. So if you could build a brand that's personal, that's fun, that's relatable, that you can, um, you know, engage people and build a community off of like, that's, what's going to set you apart from every other, uh, from, from every other brand. Do you feel you've kind of created that community uh, internally within your company for people that work for you? And it, uh, you look for a certain kind of characteristics and people, I'm sure when you onboard them and, and kind of their outfacing brand individually and how that works. Yeah, totally. I mean, we want to, we want to make stuff that we think is cool. We want to be around people that we think are cool, that we can relate with, that we can, you know, interact with on a, on a personal level. So we really look for those types of people. Um, and it's not about how skilled they are, about how experienced they are. It's about, you know, would you get a beer with that person? You know, what, what's their passions? What do they like to do on the weekends? Um, what, what motivates them? Like what's their, you know what I mean? Like just real human stuff. So, um, it's hard to find that, you know what I mean? It really is. It's hard to find that. And then also marry that with good, um, professionalism and, and good experience at the same time. So, um, believe it or not, you know, hiring and finding good people is really hard for me. You know, I could do athletes and influencers and DJs all day, but when it comes to like, you know, recruiting really good people, it's, it's hard to do that. Or at least for me it is. Um, so yeah, that's something that we're trying to get better at every day, but we have a really good team down here and everyone's doing a great job. It looks like it. they all look fun as shit. <laughs> like there's yeah. definitely people I want to have a beer with. So, uh, <laughs> you're a sole owner. Uh, you had a business partner who's in the graphic design back then. At, at what point maybe did that switch out? And was it just because it wasn't a working relationship or you happen to be doing all the work? <laughs> I mean, how, how did yeah. you continue to keep sole ownership of this company so long? So it's, it was a, it was a wild start, man. You know, I mean, we started 50, 50, um, you know, he was doing all the web, all the design, I was doing all the marketing, all the branding, and it was pretty equal. Um, but you know, we both kind of got to, or he got to a point where he, he just, he wanted to travel. He wanted to experience new things. And, um, you know, my vision for the brand was different than his. And I knew that this was a marathon, not a sprint at that point. And like, we couldn't really like take any, take any shortcuts. And so he kind of just lost a little fire and, and passion, which is, you know, which is totally normal. Um, and, you know, not many founders that have started a business together will, will complete the business together, you know. Um, and we were just in different financial positions as well. You know what I mean? Um, and so it got to a point where he just, you know, he was ready to move on. And it was very um, graceful. You know, these things could be super ugly and super nasty. They could be like a divorce. Um, but honestly, we're better friends because of it. We're closer because of it. He's starting a new business now. And that happened at the end of 2016. And so at that point forward, it was just me. It was me. And I was like, okay, this is all on me. And um, honestly, that's when things really just ricocheted up. I mean, that's when we went from, you know, a million five to seven to 30. Um, you know, we doubled the, tripled the business two years in a row. And it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. But at the same time, it was like, it was all me and there's no way I was going to let that fail, you know? Yeah. That, that's a good point. I want to get back to the financials here in a second, but going back to kind of the partnership, I mean, you're right. It's especially a 50, 50 point when you're, Hey, we're in our dorm room. Like, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Let's split the company and, and see what happens. But then <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden there's money coming in and you're like, Oh shit, like what are we going to do? And, and when one, it, it, it's great that you guys were able to split and actually like still be, be friends. Cause I, I can imagine that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> No, it doesn't. Yeah. It's definitely not. So 
in your business, I mean, if you find people aren't dragging their weight, they don't stick around probably very long either, huh? Pulling the weight. Yeah. You know, it's like, I know that from back in the day, right? I knew that like just going to trade shows when I was in, in high school, like action sports back then, it's like, they weren't even focused on the money. Like they were just focused on being cool and the cool brands finish last. The cool brands are broke, you know? So, um, I knew that a lot of like building a brand, yes, it's about being cool, but you also like, you got to make money and you got to run a good business here. So, um, if people aren't pulling their weight, if we're not growing and we're not like, you know, moving forward every day, like, you know, get out sort of thing. Like I got one shot at this. I got one blender. So there's not going to be a blenders too. And I want to give it everything I got. And, um, you know, I want to continue to grow and be as big as Oakley one day. <laughs> yeah, you will be, man. I think you will be. Yeah. Sadly, I've seen that kind of that awkward partnership thing really hold businesses back and it, it is heartbreaking, but at some point, you know, it, it, it's a choice of an owner. So, you know, you, I think you, yeah. I think you played it right. So that's great. All right, man, let's get into some numbers. Like, tell me something like really exciting. Like, all right, you're, you get, you're online, you got the sales going. I, um, you use, um, Shopify still Shopify. moved over there. That's an awesome platform. I've used that a few times, but, uh, at what point, so we had that turning point, you're, you're got some really good sales going at what point again was like, it's a really exciting kind of maybe a launch or something you, that just stands out in your mind that man, I'll never forget that time when this happened. Yeah. So for me, right. Like the biggest one was when I started the business, I, I told you I went to a nightclub and I went to go see my favorite DJ at a nightclub. And four years later, we ended up doing a collaboration with him. And for me, like just personally, that was a huge moment. Right. Um, I had to tell him a story. I emailed him over and over and over. And I was like, dude, he has to read the story. And he finally read it. And he's like, holy shit. Like, this is incredible. Like, I was like, dude, this happened the night you played in San Diego. And he's like, I, I want to do a collab with you. Let's do a custom pair. And so that was the first big collaboration we did. And for me, that was just a personal highlight and a personal goal. I'll never forget. There wasn't much like sales figures behind it, but just from like a personal accomplishment, I was like, holy shit, this is insane. You know? Um, so that was super important for me. And then we've done a lot of really cool other brand collaborations with music festivals starting out. Um, and those were super fun. Like, I love doing that stuff, right? I love doing the brand building. I love doing the collaborations. I love doing the athlete stuff. Um, Cause that's my background. That's where I came from. So uh, yeah, there's just, there's so many things that excite me within, within the brand that just get me jazzed. And um, most of it's on the brand side, not much of it's on like the business side. Like every entrepreneur loves to create, but they hate to like, they hit the finance side, they hit the operational side, they hit the supply chain side. They count so. those beans. <laughs> hey, yeah. can we give the group a shout out? Who is it again? Uh, I'm sorry. Who's the group again that you, the, the, the music group, the DJs, Gareth Emery. So Gareth Emery, he's a electronic DJ. Okay. So he's actually not a group. Yeah. He's just like a single solo single, producer. Um, uh, yeah. But, um, and then we have done tons of stuff with other, you know, DJs and influencers over the years too. Um, just cause there's a huge network of, of them down here in San Diego. Yeah. But yeah, shout out to Gareth. I'm stoked for that and I'll never forget it. And We've been homies ever since. That's, that's, a, cool. that's a great story, man. Yeah. It's not from a financial standpoint, but just a personal, like, man, yeah. dude, got these guys connected with me. That's really cool. Hey, real quick. I want to jump, uh, speak about networking in San Diego and especially in California. Like, so, you know, I know I listen to a lot of podcasts from Cali and stuff and, and I'm excited about this one because I'm based in Florida. Maybe get like a little bit different feel and vibe over here, but I, I feel like you're just in this kind of like crazy whirlpool of creatives and business owners and like, you know, people that have really cool companies, MVMT, Pure Vita bracelets, like, how does that work? Oh, how does it work? But how does that feel like when you're kind of around these groups of people and do you, do you guys bounce ideas of each other and, and work together at all? Absolutely, man. I mean, you know, my best friends are Pure Vita, the guys that own Pure Vita, all of us went to college together and they were a huge inspiration behind Blenders. You know, they were two years ahead of me. I saw them start Pure Vita from a shoestring in their bedroom and it really, really inspired me. And so um, being around the right people and surrounding yourself with the right people is critical. Like if there's one thing I can take away from this, it's like find good people that inspire you and, and stick to them like glue, you know? Um, and so, yeah, that, you know, and then, you know, we got other businesses movement, you know, rare form original brain watches is down here. Um, and there's a few other new brands popping up. So it's like, I just, it's super cool and ambition runs wild down here. And I think, uh, if you can find a good group of people that are doing something that you like, that like you want to follow, I think it's vital to your success. All right, we're gonna take a quick break here with Chase Fisher, and he is laying it down hard with some great golden nuggets. Hope you guys are picking them up, pick them up quick. 
I think one of my favorite things he said, and uh, we actually just heard right before going to the break here, is his ability and need, and everybody's ability and need in small business to find motivated people, inspirational people, and stick to them like glue. Like, keep them in your inner circle. And I can't wrap my head around why people don't take this more seriously. Take a company that has low-performing employees, a bad partner. I mean, these are things that can seriously stunt the growth of a company and also make other people not want to work there. I like to think we have a long life, but when it comes to business and growing a company, it's relatively short. So by having like these weak links and people that really aren't motivating or inspirational, like it really can stunt the growth of a company. I think Chase has realized that simply by hanging out with these great founders of companies like Pure Vita, Rare Form, Movement. I mean, just to simply be in the same room as these guys, let alone be able to grow business with them, that's, that's unreal. I also really like talking to Chase about hearing about how he actually started this company. The fact that he didn't have any product, used $2,000 to get really kind of startup, raised the additional $7,000 in Indiegogo, simply through images and getting a following on Facebook. They tested the market, they asked their customers what they wanted, and then they took that and put that into production run. Uh, this is not something they just did to get started too. You know, I continually see on blenders that they're asking their customers what they want to see uh, for next season's eyewear. You know, Chase will be at his factories and stuff, looking at all these different products and pulling ones out and like, hey, y'all like this or testing them on and putting them on. And it's just, you know, taking the time to really understand who's buying your product and why they're buying your product. You know, you're going to save a lot of heartache. Yeah, at the end of the day, you're going to save a lot of money. And it's, you know, it's fun. You get to ask and interact with your customers. And, and if you're in business, why wouldn't you? So let's jump back in with Chase Fisher for the rest of this episode with Chasing Independence. Let's go. All right. So I want to talk quickly about a common theme. Um, and this is a question I kind of ask all the uh, CEOs and athletes on the, on the podcast. But, you know, what is something that you learned in your time in action sports that you've really kind of taken over and transitioned and used in your business career? Yeah, I, I think a big one for me is I knew I knew what it was like to be an athlete. I knew what it was like to be sponsored, right? And so for me, I, I like I knew that side really well, and now I'm on the other side, and so I know what it's I know what athletes want from brands, and I know what they expect from brands, and I know how to interact with them, right? And so I think that's I think it's super important to know both sides. You know what I mean? I think I've always been close to the field. I'm always going to stay close to the field. Um, and so when we work with athletes, when we work with different people, like I know what they want and what they don't want, you know what I mean? Um, and so that comes natural for me. And I think that's important because I think there's this huge misconception that you can just work with like top talent and just always have a price tag on everything that they do and have an ROI on everything that they do. And it just, not everything is measured in, you know, I spent $5, I get $10 back. You know what I mean? There's just different value that you can get from athletes and different value you can get not only on, on on a dollar level but like on a personality level on a brand awareness level on a community level so um i think those were important things that i definitely learned and just how to work with good people you know how to network with people like action sports my ability to network with brands hit up brands get sponsored by brands uh you know pass out stickers to my friends pass out free free shit to my friends like that's what got me where I am today, you know? And so I was really good at that, doing that with blenders is I was like, I'm just a kid back at the beach again when I'm 13, you know? Um, and so that came natural to me. Fun. Yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely kind of like that opens your eyes a little bit to, you know, from traditional sports which is great for teamwork, but you know, as an action sport athlete, you're kind of an individual, you got to fight for yourself. Yeah. You got to fight whether for that podium or for the next sponsor and, and you have to be your own brand in, in sense. So let's talk, how, how do you learn now? Like, you know, so do you continue, like, what, what do you do to feed your brain? And also do you use like mentors and things to kind of help you through or, or coaches to navigate blenders or, or where does that kind of Absolutely. play into? Yeah. So obviously, like I said, you know, I have a lot of really good uh, friends down here that are doing similar things. Right. And, um, you know, that's hard to find in entrepreneurship because it's like, the, you know, you just sometimes feel like you're Tom Hanks and Castaway. You're just on this island and you're talking to your friends that have a nine to five and they have no fucking clue what you're talking about, you know, and it's just, this, you're speaking a different language. Right. Um, so San Diego has been, I've been fortunate to have good people that are doing, you know, have good brands that are good, uh, um, you know, role models and, and inspiration for me down here. I also have a business coach slash life coach that I work with on a, on a weekly basis. Um, that really makes me think in different ways and kind of challenges me in different ways, which is, I think also super important. Um, 
you know, I've really learned that like from business and, and life, like you apply similar skills to business as you do in every other category of your life. And um, like working out and fitness and any new skill that you do, like it's going to take time to develop that skill. You're not just going to walk in on day one and hit a home run, you know? So it's, everything takes work. And if you want to be extraordinary, you got to do extraordinary work, you know, period. Um, so I've learned to apply a lot of lessons I've learned in business and in surfing to every other aspect of my life. Um, and surrounding yourself with good people is super important. Um, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts down here. I'm really into the scene. I network with a lot of founders. Um, I'm not really a big reader. I don't read a lot of books, but I read a lot of blogs. Um, and yeah, I just learn from new people. You know, I'm, a, I'm, you got to stay curious. That's a, a big aspect to winning an entrepreneurship is always staying curious. Yeah. I love that. No, definitely staying curious. Yeah. Gives you kind of like that, that drive to get out and, and try something that might be uncomfortable or get in an arena that's new. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for people that are maybe plateauing in their business or they're just, I don't want to say losing the drive. Cause like, I hate to feel like an entrepreneur is losing their drive to run their own company. Maybe they shouldn't be in it at that point, but what kind of like little advice would you have for somebody that feels like there's kind of this plateau point? Like, is it getting help from a great mentor life coach? Is it finding new activities? Like what are the little things like you, you would advise? Yeah, I think it's like, I think it's always acting as if, you know, it's day one, right? I think that's super important. I think it's always super important to look at your business through newfound eyes. You know, I think it could be similar to people that are in a relationship that they've been in a relationship for a long time and they feel like they're just kind of stale, right? I think um, not really knowing what to do or not really having much motivation to like change things or just comfortable with how it is. And honestly, like an entrepreneurship, complacency is the fastest way to die. It really is. And if you don't find new ways to motivate yourself, if you don't find new ways to try new things, or you're not excited about trying new things, um, it's the wrong space for you. You know, like it's not a, it's not an area where you can just kind of coast and, Oh, just kind of figure it out as long as I go. Like if you want to win in this space, you got to be a shark every single day. And, um, at least for me, that's the only way I know how to do it. I've only been around people that have been growing. I've never really surrounded myself with complacent, uh, you know, founders. So, um, I don't actually have probably the best advice for that, but for me, I know that when I've had tough times and when I've kind of lost my vision a little bit, it's just going back to what like really inspires you and really like makes you happy and, um, making sure you're doing those things on a daily basis, you know, and not getting caught up in the, uh, in just the monotony, you know, cause it could be very hard sometimes. Um, but that's just part of the journey. You know, it's, it's not easy at all. No, that's huge. Hey, let's jump into your acquisition. I mean, first of all, congratulations. When I saw that news, I was like, holy crap, <laughs> that's, that's huge. That's awesome. <laughs> One, what was that feeling like Two, was this something that you put plans in place over the past years to say, you know, I want to be acquired or I want to sell or I want to grow bigger. And how did you attack that every day in and out? Yeah. So this was something that I, I considered about a year and a half ago was I just, you know, where we were as a business, where we were going, we were, you know, this, that was our eighth year. Um, we were growing every year and it's like continuing to grow every year organically bootstrapped is very, very difficult. And you get to a point where you're like, okay, are we going to take this to the next level and go global and take over the world? Or are we going to run this as like a lifestyle business and potentially go up and down and do this and that? And I was like, could I do the lifestyle side? Yeah. But is that going to excite me over the next five years? Probably not. Um, I was in this to grow. I was in this to build this thing as big as I can. And in order to do that, you have to hurt, you have to partner with the best, you know? Um, and so the goal was to be acquired and to partner with a strategic eyewear, uh, you know, partner that can give us the operational structure that we needed to, to scale blenders further than, um, we could do it ourselves, you know, or just faster. So that was the goal. And, um, we were able to get it done and brands like Smith that, you know, Safalo currently owns, like I used to send my resume into Smith to get sponsored, Love Smith. you know, and, <laughs> and uh, I never got sponsored by Smith, but now I'm coaching them on how to do their e-commerce. That's you know, wild, it's yeah. just like, it's just such a crazy shift, you know? Um, so yeah, that was a huge, huge, huge deal for us. It was the biggest wave I've ever surfed <laughs> for sure. Um, $90 million. That's a big, that's a big old wave, man. Now yeah. looking at it. So you, I mean, I feel like you really guys, you guys had the marketing down you had the e-commerce stuff down. What were areas that you felt that a big investment like that could help you in? Like, I guess if you're walk on shark tank, you say, I need this money for blank. Like 
what right. was that? Yeah, like blenders didn't need a cash injection. We didn't need a lot of cash to like take us to the next level, right? Like we were we were fine where we where we were, but when it really came to like providing value was operationally, like back office management. You know what I mean? Like scaling us internationally. You know, Safalo is one of the like the second largest international providers in the world. They have you know distribution centers all over the all over the world. They got new channels all over the world. Going international is very very hard. Um, so that's a big one. We were having great success in the U S and you're like, okay, from the U S where can we go? Let's go to Australia. Let's go to Europe. So they're going to help us, um, operationally set up, you know, channels internationally. Another one is supply chain, right? Like we had a very difficult time getting, uh, the, the materials that we needed at our, at our price point, you know, we're in that middle tier price point, um, which not a lot of brands are in. And in order to be the best and get the best materials, we had to get, we have to, you know, utilize our resources, um, and they're the second largest buyer of these materials in the world. So um, that's going to be also help as well. Um, prescription is a huge market. They're the one of the largest providers of prescription in the world. So like these are all things that they're experts in and all things that we're experts in, they're not. So um, it's peanut butter meets jelly, right? I mean, they're really trying to make a transformation from the old way to the new digital e-com way. And they're looking for, you know, they're looking to us to kind of, lead the path for not only blenders and, and their business, but all their other brands, you know, Smith, uh, Carrera, Mark Jacobs, all the other brands that they own. Um, they want to kind of use us to pioneer that new direction for them. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So you see something there that you're like, man, I really need this. And then they're looking at you like, gosh, we really need that. And you kind of pair yeah. the two together and it's going to be unstoppable. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> This is going to be sick. <laughs> going to be sick. All right, man. Well, I think with, yeah, because I mean, I know you guys built that uh, beautiful little um, uh, headquarters of yours and, you know, from a storefront aspect, but for you to actually get worldwide distribution in stores and make that process grow, um, it sounds like that's just the, the right path to go down, really. Yeah, no, absolutely. So let's uh, jump into a little bit of marketing. Uh, I mean, your marketing brain sounds like it's always going. What are some things you're doing right now that you're really excited about from a marketing standpoint? Yeah. So, I mean, with obviously with just this germ apocalypse that we're trying to fight through and COVID-19, some things I'm, I've been proud of and excited about is just giving back, you know, and we did a lot of like, we partnered with an organization for COVID-19 to, to raise over a hundred thousand dollars to donate, to help fight coronavirus. Like for me, that was super, super passionate about that to kind of create a tangible way to give back during this time. Um, and we also created 10,000 safety goggles that we donated to, you know, local and state hospitals in need. So right now I was most excited about that and that like fired me up and our team was really fired up about that. And then, you know, currently right now it's just, we're just continuing to move forward, right? Like while other people and other brands are falling off the wagon, like we're not, you know, we're keeping our doors open we're moving forward. Our customers want us to continue launching new products and building and moving things in a new direction. So we're continuing to kind of execute on our original plan. Um, and we're not letting this whole, you know, uh, crisis stop us. Um, obviously things have changed and you know, we're not working at our office anymore. We're, we're all working from home and things will be different, you know, coming up, but, uh, we're just taking it one day at a time. You know, it's hard to predict the future, but, um, yeah, we're, we're making the most of it. We're, co we're continuing to roll out a lot of new big projects that we've had in the pipeline, like prescription blue light, we're expanding our snow category line and we're coming out with floatable sunglasses. We're going international this year. So that's a lot of shit that I'm fired up on for sure. That's huge. Yeah. I think of the product line, everything you guys have putting out, it's a uh, very affordable, but it's good quality stuff. Like you, you see a lot of brands that just put stuff out to put their logo on it, you put their logo on it, put their logo on it, you know, but blenders always seems to kind of have this, uh, a, a very, useful and good product. Um, I got the goggles used in this last, uh, that last winter. They were great. My first mm. magnetic pair, you know, they were awesome. Nice. Got them on sale. You guys run awesome sales online. Uh, what can we talk about maybe like uh, approximately this last year of what you guys may have spent on online advertising? Yeah. So, um, I mean, we spent millions and millions and millions, you know, uh, I'm still surprised we don't get a fruit basket from Facebook every year. <laughs> I'll send you shit. How much we spent. Mark Zuckerberg, where's my fruit basket, dude? Um, yeah, so we've spent, I think last year we spent $12 million, yeah. $13 million, uh, $14 million. What, what's, over, your expected, over 10 million. what's your expected ROAS on things like that? I mean, are, are you, what's your target? 
Yeah. So, I mean, we, we spend 40% of our revenue goes to, to marketing, you know, and like any e-com brand, that's just, you always got to keep feeding the pig. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for this year, you know, we're, we're shooting for 55 to 60 million um, in, in revenue. So we'll spend anywhere between 17 to probably 24 million, yeah. something like that, 20, 23. Um, but obviously with COVID-19, it definitely threw a wrench in the mix and, uh, you know, things were kind of haywire for a little while there. Um, so considering how the next six months go, we'll see, but, uh, it's been crazy busy actually uh, unexpectedly, uh, these past few weeks, like may has been massive for us. So we're continuing to ride the wave as, as long as we can. I've seen, um, I don't know if you guys are just following me everywhere I go, but I've been actually seeing not just blenders paid sponsors of ads, but actually like influencer they're like blenders ads, but on influencer pages. Is that something you yeah, guys just so launched or what? Yeah, we just started testing a lot of new things. Um, we switched agencies last, actually, you know, in February. And so we've been just testing like crazy um, and trying a lot of new things that we were, that we just weren't doing before. So that's been a huge testament to just um, finding new kind of hacks and what's, what's working, what's not. But yeah, we're doing stuff with influencers. We're doing stuff with landing pages. We're doing stuff with like different personalized quizzes. Um, and we're trying a lot of new video ads that we haven't been able to do before. Um, so yeah, wh whatever we're doing right now is continuing to work. And I just think the thing that we weren't doing enough of was testing, you know, um, luckily with a D2C brand, you can throw stuff against the wall any day and see what sticks. And if it sticks, you keep doing it. If it doesn't, you dump it, you, you do something new. That's, that's the beauty of it. At what point do you kind of realize like it doesn't stick and to exit out? I mean, is that just kind of just by being in it every day and, and having good agency to work with and understanding what the, the market's kind of demanding? Yeah, totally. I mean, you can, you can find out pretty quickly if something's going to work or, or not work, you know? Um, so for us, we've seen a lot of different shifts in just of the content the type of content that that's worked, you know what I mean? Or that continues to work. So stuff that we did a few years ago just doesn't work anymore, you know? Um, and stuff that works nowadays is all about like relatability, like UGC, like really unpolished ads, almost like your friends just like posting it, you know what oh, I mean? Yeah. So it's like the more messy and the more like, the more rough around the edges it is, the better it performs. Um, whereas like it used to be the opposite, like how, how good it looked and like how good shades looked in the sunset. It was like this beautiful image that worked really well. And you do that now and it doesn't work. So it's like, you got to adapt to the times. At some point it kind of just drives you fucking up the wall because like I'm a video editor and would make ads and these movies and like long form and spend days just like nitpicking like the smallest shit. And then I realized like some dudes like little iPhone videos getting more click throughs to the, the final Dude. product. You're like, what the shit? <laughs> Yeah, our creative team, like our designers were just like banging their head against the wall last year with this because like this, like the iPhone, like the customer UGC photos that would that they, people would send in, that's what started converting. And our creators, our photographers in house were just like, shit, like, how is that? How are they beating me? You know? Yeah. And so we got, we got all that content out of the office because it was just, it was creating too much turmoil. Um, so now they focus on brand, it's purely on brand and our agencies do all the digital content because it's just, it's a different style of content and you have to do it in a different way. Um, even though you might not like it, you know, like I don't love everything we put out on as an ad. I'm not going to lie. I just don't, I wish our Instagram could be our ads, but they're not. <laughs> so that's just the difference. You know, yeah. there's just different, different looks. Do you see that last EMA for, I mean, I don't want to put a time stamp on it, but you know, is that something that we can see that a, a brand could actually put into place now and hopefully work through this next year or two? you know, UGC stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think for me, I, I was always trying to fight that current for a long time of like, why can our Instagram convert the way that these ads do? And you just have to accept it. Some brands do a really good job at being able to keep everything the same. And most other brands have to do it in a different way, or at least the good brands that are actually winning are changing their strategy or changing their look. Um, because the, you know, the platform's ever changing, the consumer behavior's ever changing. And so you have to be, you have to keep, you know, you have to be able to adapt as fast as you can. Um, that's what makes you survive in this world. Does your product line reflect that kind of mentality as well? Like, I mean, you, you guys kind of put out these just, I mean, really forward thinking, uh, styles. And is that something yeah. that relates to like your adaptation and ability to do that? Well, you know what? It's funny because last year we really dove into our customer data, like big time, you know, we have millions of customers and we really dove in and we built customer personas based off of all the different data we had. And we had four different customer personas. Like we had 
Broseph Brad, we had Adventurous Adam, Living Up Lindsay, and Still Got It Sharon. And I love, those I love represent, the names. <laughs> those represent different age demographics. And so we started feeding different products to each of those different demographics. So we're really hitting them on the, on the target. And that really changed the game for us this year. Like we went from all of our new products have launched and they've done six very, very well um, compared to last year where we launched a ton of new products and none of them hit. And what, what hit were just our existing styles. So we just had to keep re-upping on those. But this year it's been all new products, all new products. And that's because we took the time to build, build personas behind them. That looks sick. Well, hey, talking to me for the last 45 minutes, which one of your personas do you think I fall closest under? Adventurous Adam. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the chase. I appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah I'm gonna that's, go. that's, that's the cool one, man. I'm in that bucket too. Are you in that bucket too? Hey, speaking of mm. buckets, uh, do you know your personality type? Like I have a disc side, like have you done much of that kind of like diving in personally Dude, to like who you are? I actually haven't. I've seen a lot of that stuff. I actually haven't done it though. I need to take that. Never done a disc? I, I think you're a high eye, which is like kind of like that just out getting out there, talking to people. You can kind of like relate really easily. Um, with others and, and, uh, yeah. and sound like you, you know, you're, uh, you understand kind of what they're going through. So yeah, I think you're a high mm-hmm. eye. Um, I don't have my cheat sheet in front of me, but my old coach would <laughs> slap me in the face with that. But yeah, yeah, I definitely do. You should take one of those. And I think you should have everybody in your office take one too. I, you're right. I will. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when I, you've gotten this far without doing it. Who, who knows? <laughs> I don't know what else. So, well, let's do Chase. Uh, we're wrapping up on this hour, dude. I really, um, uh, had a blast talking to you. Is there any last moment advice you might have for either a uh, upcoming athlete who's looking maybe to connect with a really cool brand and then on the flip side, a brand who's just trying to really just take it to that next level. Yeah. So I think from an athlete perspective, if you're just, you know, trying to get sponsored, I think it's, it's, it's always been the same and I think it's going to continue being the same. It's like, what can you provide? Like what value can you provide? And I think that's on both sides to the brand level and to, you know, the, you know, the personal level, what value can you provide? What can you give? Um, I think there's a lot of people that want to just take, 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 and uh, this world needs more givers. And, and the, the, the people that give uh, are, are the ones that get paid, get paid in spades down the road. Right. Um, at least that's, that's what I know. So karma's karma's karma makes the world go around. Um, on the brand side, I think if you're building a brand, if you're, if you're trying to start a new brand, like for me, when I was starting, I always thought entrepreneurs had to be 4.0 students had to be super, super smart. Um, and the truth is you don't have to be smart to be successful. You know, you just, like hard work outpaces being genius minded um, and hard, the harder you work and, and the discipline you have towards something. And if you're passionate about it, like you will make it, you know, the best advice I ever got was the only way you're going to fail is if, is if you stop. So just keep going. And that's why we built blenders around life and forward motion. It's just, it's a brand that's never going to stop. We're going to always keep going forward. Um, so for me, those are two things that I would recommend. Uh, I got a ton of other advice too. I don't want to bore you on it, but um yeah, that's probably what hey, I Hey, drop some knowledge real quick, man. Go, go. If you want to drop one more piece, I'm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I ain't go nowhere. I'm a lot. Adventure Adam is locked in this house right now. So go for it. <laughs> I would say, you know, focus on winning the day, right? I think when you're really beginning your new career, you're, you're, you're beginning something new. Like you get caught up in like the big picture and you get caught up in the vision. And, um, you know, you don't really know how to, you don't really know what that vision looks like. And so I think the only way you can piece it together is really focusing on one day at a time. And given the times that we're in with COVID too, it's, you know, you don't know what tomorrow holds at this point, you know, so really focusing on today, winning today, what, do you, what can you do today to set you up for tomorrow um, is critical because it's so easy to get caught up and, you know, get your head in the clouds and kind of small stuff and, yeah. and kind of lose focus. Um, success tastes so much better when it's infused with passion. So if you do something that you truly love, um, you know, it tastes a lot better and it feels a lot better when you actually do make it. And I think this whole like follow your passion thing is cool. But at the same time, like you have to know what you don't like before you can, before you know what you do like, right. Or before you get to work on stuff that you truly like, you have to do a ton of shit you don't like to do, or, or maybe you, you suck at. And for me, I didn't realize that starting blenders. I was like, okay, I'm just going to do the brand side, but it's like, how do I do the operational side? How do I do the supply chain side? How do I do customer service? How do I do accounting? Like you have to really know that, I'm going to have to do a lot of shit. I'm going to have to eat a lot of dirt before I can smell the roses sort of thing. Um, so, you know, can you do it faster these days? Absolutely. There's better technology. There's easier ways to do things. Like it might not take you eight years like it took me, but um, I know how hard it takes or how much you know work it takes. And if you're not willing to put in the work or if you're not willing to make massive sacrifices, like it's not for you, you know? 
So yeah, it tastes good, but it, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta pay your dues, man. At the same time. <laughs> gotta eat the dirt guys. Yeah. You gotta eat the dirt. What uh, do you do personally, maybe to attack the day? Like, are you uh, very organized? Are you a planner writer? Uh, how, how do you lay that out? Maybe? Yeah, I think, I mean, look, like for me, I take pride in, in the details, you know, and I think success and being, um, being good at what you do is, is mastering the daily drip. It's getting, it's getting up every single day. It's having a routine every single day. Um, it's making your bed every single day. It's just doing the small shit and doing it really, really good. Um, like that's how you're going to win, right? You can't skip over that stuff. You, you just can't. Um, so in order to move, in order to move mountains, you gotta, you gotta put one foot in front of the other, but you really got to take pride in every step that you do. Um, and that's, yeah, for me, that's super important. You know, I, I would say I would recommend getting an outdoor hobby. If you don't have one, I recommend it because you're going to need one. You're going to go crazy. You're going to need to bang your head against the wall and you're going to need to go surfing or punch a punching bag or something cause you're going to be stressed out. So, um, you need to stay active. You need to get, you know, have, have a good support group. You need to have people that believe in you, you need to surround yourself with the right people. You have to have a good routine. Um, and you got to dedicate yourself to this for many, many years and know that it's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done, but the most rewarding at the same time. Gosh, man, I, I think we, we've really hit a lot of golden nuggets in this one. And you've, uh, you laid it out in such a easy way, I think for people to understand and your ability to kind of talk and coach people through that is just unreal. So thank you so much for taking this time today and giving this to our listeners. Totally, man. And like, you know, like, look, like I struggled in school. I struggled in school. I was in special ed classes since I was in, since I was up until college. I'm dyslexic. Um, I had reading comprehension classes. Like I was not the smart kid in class. I just wasn't, you know, I struggled. So like, just know that if I can do it, anyone can do it. And the story lies in the struggle. You're like this shit is not easy. Um, but I want, I want you to know that because that's what humanizes me. You know what I mean? Like I, I, this was not easy. I'm my experience probably came at a loss compared to other people. Um, but hard work really out will really win any race. Um, so just know that, just, just know that if you are starting, <laughs> No, that's great, man. Thank you so much again for taking the time. Where can people find you, I guess? And of course, Blenders, we'll, we'll add that in the show notes. Yeah, so check me out on Instagram at Chase Fisher. Uh, BlendersEyewear.com is our website, or you can follow us on Instagram at Blenders Eyewear. And hit me up anytime. Come If you're in San Diego, our door is always open. Uh, you can grab a burrito and a Corona, six feet apart for now, <laughs> and we'll catch some waves. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll be there before you know it. Don't worry. And uh, can't wait to hear about more success, with, uh, especially with this new merger. That's like, super exciting. We'll be following it all the way there. So, awesome. guys, thank you for sticking around on this episode. Big thanks to Chase, man. You're a rock star. That was awesome. And I think we're going to get out of here. Let everybody get back to their our day. Sounds good, dude. <laughs> thank, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Dude, thank you. Pleasure's all mine. Guys, this is Chase with the Chase Independence Podcast. Until next time, I'll catch you on the flip side. Wow, that was a fun one. I am super grateful to Chase for uh, reaching back out and letting us do that. Uh, again, we had to do it online because, uh, unfortunately, with the lockdowns and COVID-19 and everything happening, travel is very hard. So I really appreciate, it, at least you guys, for listening in and, and taking the time, too. So uh, if you guys enjoyed that episode, please head over to Instagram, shoot me a DM, shoot Chase a DM with a thumbs up, share it with some friends. You can subscribe on Spotify or iTunes, just Chase the Independence Podcast from Podium's Prosperity. And yeah, we're going to uh, keep rocking. we got some really great interviews coming up. We have John Modica, professional kite surfer, who uh, started a really cool education company, sold that, and then he saw an opportunity to buy Cabrina Kites, which was actually a sponsor of his for years. Uh, they create some of the best kiteboarding equipment in the world, and uh, he created a fund with a couple other very wealthy uh, kite surfers, and they bought it. And he talks all about it. Like, dude, that's that's the coolest dream, like, vision, anything you could possibly think of ever, I think, like... 
Uh, I love Cabrini kites. I fly them myself. So I thought that's a really cool episode. I also catch up with professional wakeboarder Adam Fields at his wakeboard camp on Lake Gaston in North Carolina. He talks about the struggles of leaving wakeboarding and pursuing his ultimate dream of owning a wakeboard camp. He also does a bunch of boat rentals and is really influential in the community up there. So a really cool story from Adam. And then I catch up with Greg Norman Jr., the son of professional golfer and entrepreneur Greg Norman. Greg's experience in both traditional and action sports have led to an exciting life as a professional kite surfer, wakeboarder, and also helped him open two really cool cable parks, one in West Palm Beach and the other in Myrtle Beach. I'm going to take the opportunity to sit down with Greg at his home park in West Palm Beach, Shark Wake Park, and we're going to do the interview as well as take a bunch of laps on that sweet, sweet cable park. So stay tuned for some awesome interviews coming up. If you have any recommendations or people that you think I should talk to in the action sports realm, please send them my way on Instagram at Chase Selmeyer. You can find us on Facebook at the Chasing Independence Podcast. And with that, let's get the hell out of here. Hope you guys have an awesome rest of the week. Stay motivated. Stay positive. Stay awesome. I'm your host, Chase Selmeyer, and I'll catch you on the flip side.